Are you a helicopter parent? Or even worse, a concierge parent? This episode is all about tips for raising financial grown-ups. Episode 238 features Bobby Rebel, author, speaker, certified financial planner. So parents are like 26, I got a 30-year-old at home. But when you talk to journalists that maybe aren't in that position, they go, well, what, you know, why not 22? Like, why not 18, right? Shouldn't that be adulthood? And the truth is that's not realistic anymore. And that's something we should really start discussing because where does this, where is this pattern going? Because at a certain point, if you're not hitting life milestones, then, you know, how does this play out as they get older? Are they going to miss out on things that maybe they wanted to do because they were still not financial grownups? I'm Andy Wong, host of the Inspired Money podcast and financial advisor at Runnymede Capital Management. This episode is brought to you by Seeking Alpha. Seeking Alpha Premium is a subscription service that gets you everything you need to make smarter investing decisions. Whether you have a portfolio of stocks, ETFs, or mutual funds, Seeking Alpha Premium gives you expert market analysis, proprietary quant ratings, unlimited call transcripts and earnings calls, powerful stock screeners, and more. It's quick and easy to link your brokerage account. With Seeking Alpha Quant Ratings, Author Ratings, and Wall Street Ratings, you'll immediately get a snapshot that tells you which stocks in your portfolio rank well or those that might require attention. Join over 200,000 subscribers today. I have a special for you too. Use the link inspiredmoney.fm alpha for a 14-day trial. You'll get 50% off by buying the annual plan. It's $179.99 which works out to less than $15 a month. We have Bobby Rebel, CFP, back on the show. Look for her episode in the back catalog to hear Bobby's career path from global business news anchor and personal finance columnist at Reuters to launching her financial grown-up brand. Today, we're going to talk about her new book, Launching Financial Grown-Ups. It's a guide for parents and grandparents of children between the ages of 16 to 26. It's all about generational wealth, relationships, and communication to help you raise financially successful kids. In this episode, you'll learn how not to be a helicopter parent, tips for teaching your kids important money lessons, and tune in to the end to hear why Bobby's daughter bought a Disney season pass. Was it a wise financial decision? Now let's get inspired with Bobby Rebel. Bobby, welcome back to Inspired Money. It's so great to have you on the show. Thank you so much for having me back. <laughs> you were an Inspired Money guest back in 2018, episode 42. I can't believe that was nearly four years ago. Tell us how things are going with your workaholic tendencies and your financial grown-up brand. Thank you so much for asking. Well, I think your listeners will be happy to know that I have stepped off the treadmill to a large degree. I was really burning out and I had a tough time. So I would say I'm no longer a workaholic. I'm a workaholic right now for a very set time period because I just had a new book released called Launching Financial Grownups. So right now I am sort of in workaholic mode, but I really took a step back and I credit to some degree as with, this is not original in any way, but with the pandemic, I really did. And again, I'm such a stereotype, but I really did take a step back and realize how overscheduled not only was I, but everyone in my life was overscheduled. And I look back at the calendar or even just my camera roll and I think, oh my goodness, how was I doing all this? What was I doing to my family? We had way too much on the calendar. And now we try to just do less. And I started playing golf in the pandemic. And that's been great. When I started it, Andy, I had my phone out and I'm like taking pictures for social media and I'm constantly checking my messages. And now I've gotten to a point where I put my phone in the bag and I don't get it till four hours later, we're done playing. And I think that's 90% really good. There's always the 10% when someone's really annoyed that they couldn't reach you or you forgot to do something or whatever. But overall, it's really good that I now do not even want to look at my phone when I play golf. And just the fact that I do play golf because it's, it's a lot of time. It's four hours. But I've made it a priority and I block days on my calendar. So I'll have really busy days when I have sort of all my meetings condensed together. And then I do keep one 
usually one day a week and then a half day to play golf, which I think has been really healthy for me. So I have sort of worked through my workaholic addiction. So thank you for asking. That's a great silver lining to <laughs> the COVID pandemic. Has your dad given up on you working on Wall Street yet? It's, oh my God, I love this question. So, okay, this is great. So you read my book and so you you know from this book as well as the previous book that whatever I did, it was always like, okay, now are you going to get a real job? Real jobs meaning a job on Wall Street. And even when I got my CFP, which was in 2017, oh, you're going to go work on Wall Street now. And so he, so he goes and he reads the book and it's got to be very interesting as a parent, and you are a parent of three, to read a book written by your child and it's recounting memories of their childhood and the things that you did as a parent from their perspective and they see it very differently. So he's, he read it and I would get these calls from my dad going, oh, did I... I didn't mean to tell, I feel bad. I didn't, I didn't, I don't think I ever told you you, you couldn't do journalism unless you did business news. I, I don't remember saying that you couldn't. I, I thought I just sort of encouraged you. And I'm like, you did that. It's okay. It's okay. And so he sort of, and then he, and then the good things, he's like, I, he read about the fact that he um, had sat each of my siblings down when we were in college and said to us, we had to present him with what our financial needs would be for the upcoming semester in college and sort of justify a budget. And he was very generous. He would write a check. I always underestimated because when you're a kid and you're estimating what you're going to need for you know four or five months, it was a big number. And I felt bad asking. I felt it was not appropriate for me to ask my dad for so much money. And we did have jobs. So, But he was like, Oh, he's like, I didn't really think through that I was teaching you a financial lesson. I was just trying to like check it off my list to give my kids the money they needed for school. I really didn't think about the fact that I was asking you to estimate how much you would need for the semester and that you were going through and figuring out what all of your costs would be. That was a pretty good lesson. I did a good job. So it was it was just interesting having a parent read a child's perspective on how they did as a parent in a parenting book that is dedicated to them. Well, that's a great <laughs> lesson already. I have to do that when my kids are going off to college, that they have to prepare a budget. That is amazing. But I love that with this book, Launching Financial Grownups, and I'll say the whole thing, live your richest life by helping your almost adult kids become everyday money smart. It's cool that you can look at back when you were a young adult, and now as the parent, you're looking at your kids. And it does seem very like... This book is pandemic centric in that you write a lot about how the pandemic caused these conversations, like the increased family time that you had um, really gave you more ammo for this book. Well, to what we were talking about before, where my family was so overscheduled suddenly in the pandemic, not only were your kids living at home, they were living at home because of a, a systemic reason. I hope I said that correctly. And so first of all, there wasn't this shame that there sometimes is when you live at home. It was normalized because that's what many of their peers were doing. It was sort of the accepted thing to do. They also suddenly had empty calendars. So if a kid were to move home in the before times, they might be sleeping at home, but they have kind of all the normal plans that they might have with their friends. Now, they might be on a Zoom call here and there with their friends, but they were really home and their attention was home and they weren't running off to different activities or to dinner with other people. They were all having dinner with you. So you didn't have these distractions and you had so much time. And if you remember, we were all doing things like baking banana bread and whatever, all, all the different, I did banana bread. I don't know, what did you bake? We made focaccia bread. Oh, that's ambitious. I think the most ambitious thing we did was donuts. We did donuts. Um, but it was it was just an interesting time because you were sort of coming up with activities to do as a family because you had so much time. And you also had your kids there as adults for the first time in many cases since they left for college. So it was a very different dynamic because you were – seeing them as adults. And in many cases, they were doing things that you may have not really understood that they did, like really working hard. I mean, I have a daughter who's a, a consultant and the door just closed for the day. I mean, she was working very long hours, even though she was working from home. 
I felt like I, I, I was like, oh my goodness, you have a whole new level of respect for your children as adults because you see them as adults. And one of our challenges as parents is that we don't always recognize the adulthood of our children and we continue to, to treat them as if they need parents of a child from us. Parents of an adult is a very different role and we have to kind of make that adjustment. And I certainly really struggled with it. I mean, this book is my cry for help. This is my going out to people that are experts because I was just failing all over the place. And I continue, by the way, to have to catch myself from having failures. Even after the book was written, I have to catch myself and understand that my kids are adults and they can do things by themselves and I don't have to do them for them. Well, I think that launching financial grownups, it's needed because personal finance isn't taught enough in schools. Many of us in the personal finance and planning space, we talk about this all the time, but you're saying to fill that educational void, that responsibility falls on the parents, right? So more is more in this case, Andy. I am pro personal finance education wherever people can get it. So I think the schools can play a wonderful role. That said, who is the ultimate stakeholder here, right? The schools are really temporary. And also when your child is in school, in many cases, they don't have the full adult financial responsibilities. They might have student loans that they should be aware of. They're probably not actively paying them. They might have a car. They might have car payments. You might, as a parent, have them have some financial responsibilities, but it's generally not the same as full-time adult financial responsibilities. And it's when they get that first job and they have to actually enroll in the 401k and make sure those that money is actually invested and what is it actually invested in and make those kinds of decisions. And if they're working for themselves, they have to actively make sure they put away money for taxes. Whatever it may be, you as a parent are the one that's going to be there to teach them when it's real versus academic. And there is a big difference. And you as a parent are the ultimate stakeholder, I believe, besides the child themselves, the adult child themselves, because you may one day need them to help you. We don't want that situation, but things happen. And so not only do you need them to launch and be their own financial grownups, you need them to be prepared if they need to step in, maybe to help you, maybe to help another family member, a sibling, and the more stable they can be in terms of their financial knowledge and their financial foundation, the better you're going to have the better family ecosystem, I guess you're going to have. And that's a term I also use in the book, the family ecosystem, which is the fact that even though for a lot of your life with your child, you're the one that's sort of more, the, you're the parent, you're the one supporting them financially and otherwise, the tables can turn sometimes when you don't even expect it. Even in the pandemic, many children had to help their parents. That was not predicted because entire industries just ground to a halt. So if you had parents, they might've been in different industries but if they both ground to a halt and the kid had income or more financial means, they might have stepped up to help the parents. So isn't that a wonderful gift to give your kids the confidence that they're going to be there for you? What's better than that? Absolutely. Well, and hope they never have to be. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love that the book is a practical guide for parents, for grandparents. And it comes at a perfect time for me since the oldest of our three turns 15 later this year. I think that the age range is like, this is for parents and grandparents of young grownups, 16 to 26. Yes. Let's start here. How are parents sometimes obstacles to their children becoming financial grownups? Well, we are a generation very much of helicopter parents, and that's a generalization. But I would say that many parents don't even recognize the helicopter parent things that they do. We also are reactionary to our parents. Many, a lot of the parents that this relates to are Gen Xers. And there's a lot of memes. I just I just started a TikTok channel. It's just my name if anyone wants to find me and have some cringy material. But in my TikTok research, I have seen that there are all these memes about what childhood was like for Gen Xers. And we were the latchkey kids. We were the kids where parents would just say, go play and just be home for dinner-ish, right? They didn't, they weren't over-parenting and somehow we got into this over-scheduling. And part of that, by the way, is a societal shift where women were working. You had both parents working and the kids get done at three and we don't get done until five or six or later because a lot of us were workaholics because we were told, do your careers. And so from the guilt, we sort of over-parent as well and over-schedule. So it's sort of a reaction to big picture things that we were doing. And so 
we tend to get into this pattern where we have our identity so tied to our children that it becomes very hard to let go. I mean, there must be parents in your kid's school, certainly when they were younger, that you only know as Joey's mom or David's dad, whatever it is, right? You don't even know their name. You don't know what they do outside of being that kid's parent. That's bananas. We've surrendered our identity completely in service of just being our child's parent. And that's something that we have to take a step back and look at how, you know, what we're doing. Do you think that changed? Do you think when we were kids, did our parents all know each other by their name and by their job? Less, less emphasis on the kids? I'm not sure. I don't I never know thought about, about that. I think, I think, well, I don't know about know them. I think there wasn't necessarily parents socializing with each other because I think the parents were just much more detached from their kids. They didn't get derived their identity from their children in the same way. So I think that a lot of parents were so busy working. There were just a lot of latchkey kids and there wasn't as much um, constant supervision and what you know has become known as helicopter parenting. There was a lot more sort of room to grow and make mistakes as a kid. Um, now, you know, we, if we let a kid climb a tree, we're probably running to put, you know, knee pads on their knees so they don't fall or a helmet. Think about it. I mean, now they wear, now the kids wear helmets when they ride the bikes. It, we're just much more protective of our children. And a lot of that's really good because I, I mean, it's, you know, there's this, we could go on a big tangent here, but there's all kinds of studies. There's, you know, there's less teen pregnancy. There's fewer kids that smoke cigarettes, all this stuff. I mean, there's just, we got in a lot of trouble as kids, as a generation compared to today's kids. A lot of that has to do also with technology because we know where they are. If they're not here, we can just check, you know, find my phone and many different apps, right? We can text them. We didn't have that connection with our children, with our parents didn't have those tools when we were younger. And yet we were more free and more unsupervised than kids today. Yeah, I think I'm a little schizophrenic or maybe it's just that I'm a dad. Like maybe it's a male thing. I always, I'm like, oh, the kid's, the kid's fine. If he falls, if she falls, I'm like, the kid's fine. No problem. No big deal. But yeah. <laughs> sometimes I do need to take a look. I'm like, maybe it was more serious than I thought. My bias yeah. is always that. Oh, the kids are re the kids resilient. I think you're more the exception than the rule. I think there's a lot. I mean, even just the trophy thing and so much positive reinforcement and so much encouragement, even if it's not, you know, even if they don't show real skills in something, we're praising them and encouraging them and supporting them. And, you know, it's just, it's just a, a more gentle world these days, I think, for children, or at least we try to be. We try to protect them longer. We try to keep them young longer. And then that translates as they get older that they don't. I mean, it used to be a little bit of a slacker thing if you moved home after college or if you just lived at home after high school if you weren't going to college. And now it's totally acceptable as a very smart thing to do, right? So our attitude has changed at so people have asked me, I've been doing a bunch of interviews for the book and people say, why 26? Why is 26 the age that you sort of end the book focused at versus 22? And the funny thing is, so when I get reactions from parents, so parents are like 26, I got a 30 year old at home. But when you talk to journalists that maybe aren't in that position, they go, well, what, you know, why not 22? Like, why not 18? Right? Shouldn't that be adulthood? And the truth is that's not realistic anymore. And that's something we should really start discussing because where does this, where's this pattern going? Because at a certain point, if you're not hitting life milestones, then, you know, how does this play out as they get older? Are they going to miss out on things that maybe they wanted to do because they were still not financial grownups? They were not taking ownership of their money. And that's something that we're depriving them of. If we don't say to them, we love you enough to tell you that you can do it. And we're there to help you and support you, but we expect you to function as an adult. Well, I love the way that you framed this because in the book, you're, you're really telling parents that they need their kids to be successful in their financial freedom so that the parents can actually reach financial freedom in retirement. Otherwise, if you don't know where to cut the cord or when to cut the cord, it's going to be a drag on your retirement years. 
Yeah. I mean, a lot of parents will take money out of their retirement funds to help support their young adult children. And that is just a recipe for disaster because what happens then, first of all, what happens to the child when you can't, they haven't learned to be self-sufficient. And again, we're giving, I mean, in this book I'm giving to age 26, 26 is not young. They should be able to support themselves by 26. And if they're not making enough money to support themselves by 26, they need to adjust their lifestyle right? Maybe they need another roommate. Maybe they need to think about what city they're living in. Maybe they need to rethink whether the career they're in is viable to support the lifestyle that they want. So we're not even cutting them off at 18 or 22. 26 is, is adulthood. They're adults. And we have this thing where people are saying, I am adulting. It's like become this catchphrase and it sort of makes it like not that serious, like, haha, I'm pretending to be an adult. But in many cases, when you look at the age of someone who's sort of joking, like, yay, I'm adulting, they are adults. They're not playing at being an adult. They're an adult and you need to start treating them as an adult. And as I said, believe in your children. Let them know that you know they got this and that you're there for them, you're going to be there in an emergency. I'm not telling people to just cut off their kids. I mean, if someone's going to cut off their kids, they don't need my book. They're done. That's a one line answer. Then, you know, whatever age you want to cut off your kid, do it. But most parents that were helicopter parents or snowplow parents, I like the term concierge parents. It is not realistic to tell them to cut off their kids. So what they need to do is work with their children to get their children to the life stage that they're, that's appropriate for them. Well, my oldest is 14. Your youngest is 14. You have two older young adult stepkids. So you're ahead of yes. me. What are the things that yes. I have to prepare myself for? And I guess my, my specific question is, it just seems like this push and pull of when do you allow kids the space to make their own financial mistakes so that they can learn? And when do you step in and sometimes you're subsidizing. Like, how do you walk that line? What, what's what been your experience? I think it's a judgment call that each parent needs to make based on the child's maturity, based on their interests, based on their needs, based on their goals and expectations, combined with your goals and expectations for them, because you are allowed to have certain expectations. They, they If they're going to be you know, subsidized by you, they need to meet your expectations. So it's important to have a conversation. And in that conversation, people have asked me, well, what's the script? What should I say? The answer is you want to say less. You want to listen to them and hear what they have to say. Because the hardest thing at this age, at these ages, is not the information. And while my book does have information on explaining what certain things are in terms of financial terms, things your audience would be very familiar with, a lot of it is talks with financial therapists and understanding why they aren't where, where you feel they should be or how to get them there. And it comes down to how you speak to them more than what you say to them. You know, think about the tone that you're using. Are you judging them? Are you making them feel like a failure? Or are you saying to them, hey, we're in this together. I'm here to support you, but tell me where you want to go. And then let's discuss how we can get you there. Sometimes I think it's a little of both. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes we are hard on them. <laughs> but we have to sort of, and there's nothing wrong with making clear that you have expectations and you know they can be great. And you can show you're disappointed, but I think it's, it's I've worked really hard to say, to sort of, if I'm upset about something rather than yell at them and, you know, say something that I'm not going to say here, uh, to just quietly say, sometimes a very quiet tone, just saying, you know, pause and absorb what they're saying and just say, well, you know, I'm disappointed and, you know, I'm, I want to work with you on, you know, how we can figure out how to make this work next time, you know, just, but make it clear that you're on their team, not against them and that they're not doing it for you. They're doing it for themselves and you're there to support them. But part of that means also accepting that, that their goals may not always be aligned with your goals. And you have to remember that just as you joked about my father wanting me to work on Wall Street, he had to come to accept that that was just not my goal. And I would have more money probably if I worked on Wall Street, assuming I was successful. But this was my where I wanted to be. And I was willing to sort of accept that I may not be able to go on the same level vacations that he has gone on. And, you know, we, my husband and I have to figure out our budgets and how much we're going to do, you know, we're, we're currently renovating parts of our apartment and we have to make choices. So sure, if we had 
a certain amount more money, we maybe wouldn't have to make those choices. But everyone, I think, first of all, by the way, whatever amount of money you have, you know this, you always need just a little more and you'll be good no matter what you have. It's always true. I said to a real estate agent when I was looking for my first studio, I said, I, it must be so hard to shop with me because I have such a limited budget. I feel like if I only had $10,000 more, we'd have so much more to look at. And he said, that's so not true. If you had $10,000 more, as with every client I have, they always need just this little amount more. That's always They're always just short of what they think they need. But the minute they have that, they need something just a bit more. So there's always going to be that, and you have to just accept that. And if you had a billion dollars, the lifestyle creep would still be there. So you'd be looking to spend yeah. $100 million and you're like, oh, if, if only I had 10 more million. Exactly. Maybe not, but I think I would be good with that. <laughs> but that said... You know, it, look, I got a dad, by the way, my poor father being, you know, <laughs> um, he, he come, so he's done well. He worked on Wall Street. He's done pretty well. Um, he takes the bus all the time. <laughs> and then he'll be late. I'll be like, well, well, why were you late? I took the bus. It's a but, but dad, you know, you really could afford a taxi at this point in your life. You're 81 years old and it's two different buses. You're waiting for them to connect. And you know, what's, what are you doing? You're saving $5. He's like, but I, why would I waste money on a taxi? There you go. I'm sure it makes him happy that he saved money. He just, it's, it's just, it's not even about that. It's just like, why would you take a taxi? You, I would take the bus. It's just, it's a mindset. And so, you know, it just, I don't know. My dad's great. It's, it was, it's, you know, I think it's gotta be weird for him. I think he's, he's happy, but it's a little bit, the last few weeks have been a little odd for him. Hmm. Like times change, right? Like when we were growing up, I would save money and then I'd actually spend the bills. Today, and the, I'm talking paper bills, but kids, everything's electronic now. Like, <laughs> I think my not all my kids have a phone yet, but it's like Venmo. Everything's swiping or tapping something. To, it's it's just easy to spend money. Any tips for how we can teach our kids to? understand budgets and spending limits because i think you and your son harry you you even used apps yeah we use an app yeah i like the app because then i know if he's somewhere and he decides to stop with his friends and by the way it's crazy he eats salad it's the weirdest thing he's like We're my going son does salad. too his they, favorite the thing is a caesar fun. salad yeah, he my son too he loves caesar salad he loves going to the salad you know the takeout salad places with his friends my son would rather eat a Caesar salad than to have an ice cream sometimes. Okay, that's unusual. Bizarre. <laughs> <laughs> um, so fr from a parent and protection standpoint, I like the fact that if he's ever in trouble, I can always zap him some money. Is that the Greenlight app? I use Greenlight, yeah. Okay, so how does that work? What does that look like between you and Harry? Oh, it's just a button. It's It couldn't be easier. It couldn't be easier. But in terms of the electronic versus cash... We did do the three jars that Ron Lieber, who's also in the book that he recommends, when, which is, uh, I think it's um, Save, Spend, Give. And um, we did do that when he was younger because it's very tactile. And I think young kids can learn about money. Actually, you know, their coins and dollar bills do still exist. So you can use them as a teaching exercise. But the reality is I think it's important to teach kids about money the way they'll actually use it. And they will. the reality is they're, they're going to actually use it in its electronic form whether we like it or not, that is where society is and is going. So you have to find ways to start a conversation and pull up the screens. And I prefer to look at it as a positive because here you have a track record of everything your kids spent. So if my kid goes to Krispy Kreme, I can look and I'm like, you're Krispy Kreme today. We talked about eating healthy. What's going on? Right? So or we could talk about, it and I will say to him, well, what did, what did that cost? And he can look it up, but it, it, you know, it's there. So you can still start conversations with it. In a taxi in New York City, they have a breakdown of how the fare is being computed. So I always have him take out the app. He has it on his phone called Curb. I don't know if you – well, you're in Jersey. So the taxis in many cities have Curb, and he types in the number to pair it, and then he you know, can see on the screen, well, there's the initial – fee to get into the cab and you can see the breakdown of all of the costs associated with the taxi so that he can kind of discuss it with me and understand how it works. 
and the tip, we can discuss the tip and so on. So in a way, it creates a place to have a conversation where you can see the numbers actually more clearly than just kind of throwing cash at the, you know, cabbie or the waiter or whatever it is, just putting down cash. You can have the discussion even later because it's right with you. I need more apps. I actually need to get my kids' phones. I'm kind of in the camp of, I want to wait as long as possible before giving my kids a phone. But I did. My, he was the second to last kid. I can't remember. What are we doing? I think we told my son seventh grade we'll give him a phone. Okay. And my daughter got her seventh grade. I think Harry got it in sixth grade. But he was the second to last kid to get it. So. You guys are in New York City. You're more advanced than us country bumpkins. Oh, I don't know about that. But <laughs> I'm not sure. And if that's true, I don't know that that's a good thing. So, so your book had a couple shockers for me. Talk about the student parent debt crisis. Yeah. So we, first of all, I'm very, as a parent of someone who we just, I think tomorrow we're making our last payment for child number two, um, graduating from college. And so I'm very frustrated. Not so, I mean, first of all, yes, the student debt is horrific, but let's start with the fact that the college tuition is bloated to a level that is offensive. There is no reason to have tuitions this high. It's not okay. And these universities are bloated. They sort of got into this arms race with all the amenities and they have to find a way to fix the system. Because if they were a corporation that reported to shareholders, this would not be going on. There's so much bloat and waste and it's not okay because that is the heart of the problem is that it's too expensive. And you can see there's a little anger coming out in my voice because we were in a position where it's been challenging to pay for college, but we were not, not only were we not candidates for a scholarship, the truth is we, a need scholarship, it wouldn't have been right. You know, people said, well, why don't you just apply to all these scholarships? Well, we can pay. So I don't need to take money from some other, from somebody else's kid, but there are other things that we would prefer to spend money on. And I really feel the money is so wasted by these schools. The just the, the numbers are just too large because there's no accountability. Even during the pandemic, when they were just learning online and my son is in a film program, so you're doing film and TV online. No, it doesn't work. There's There was no concession, nothing. And it's very frustrating. What I talk about in the book that I think does not get enough attention is that while there are some remedies that are coming into place for student loans and some relief, the parent loans are also a problem that need to get attention because parent loans have much lower barriers to entry. They have fewer protections and many parents carry a lot of debt for their children's schooling that they feel they have no choice but to take out. And then they are left with their years as they head into retirement, they're paying off these massive loans and that's tragic. And again, I think it all goes back to these the prices just simply being too high. No one, I mean, I, I have to think, but I believe... Um, if I'm doing the math correctly, um, my son's tuition, he's at NYU. So anyone out there can look it up. It's public information. I'm going to think it's close to 70 a year, not counting room and board. So, you know, you're looking at close to a hundred thousand dollars a year. There's no one that can really afford that. And if you, if you, you know, in terms of regular people and even if you're saving, so, I just, I, I'm angry at the college system for the, the prices more than anything. And I, I don't know why that doesn't get more attention. I'm glad there's some relief for the students though, because it's not right to force our young people to have this horrible burden as they, just because they want to have an education. It's like you're being punished for wanting to do well. Well, case in point, and not to, you know, get you angry, not to stir the pot, but the students do not need sushi in their cafeteria. Like no college student needs sushi. Or whatever. I mean, it's just the <laughs> amount of money that's going on in the landscaping and the different amenities and the extra programs. And part of that's because the schools are competing for the students. So it becomes this kind of, you know, race to get the students and charm them into coming to your school. But yet they ha they've gotten away from teaching. I mean, the teaching might be great. I'm not saying they're not, the education is not excellent. Some places it is, but the value ratio is just out of proportion. And these other amenities have become such a bloat and I don't know how they get out of it, but something has to be done beyond 
uh, someone, I mean, you're asking people to pay for, so what's the solution? If you just forgive student loans, well, then that doesn't help if it's a private loan. That's not fair to the corporation. If someone lends you money, they deserve to be paid back. And if that someone is the federal government, well, then the taxpayers are being paid back. So something has to give. And I would like the universities to do their part. I think your book had a line that said, the loan should never be taken out in the parent's name. Like, what is the just the general advice for good parenting and for the young, for the young grownups? Every situation is different, but it's really tragic when parents derail their retirement because they've taken out excessive loans for their children. Um, I think it's important to remember that you don't have to pay it all up front. I mean, we went on payment plans where we pay monthly. You think it's fifty bucks a year? And you're not charged interest, and they just hit your bank account every four weeks. Um, you know, so you don't you know you don't have to have it all up front. And you know, yeah, you can take out student loans, you can take out parent loans, but look for scholarships, and look for you know where the value is for your school. And and you know what's nice is that these days you don't have to go to college necessarily right away. You can take a gap year. Um, our oldest did that, and it was really valuable because she um, she was admitted to the teaching school at her university, but by the time she went, she had really thought about the lifestyle that she wants, and she switched to the School of Informatics, and she's now basically a cybersecurity consultant making a very healthy income, much more long-term potential for income upside than being a teacher. And she likes what she does, but it's a lot of work. But she also really likes the financial stability that it gives her to be able to do things like sh that she wants. She owns her own apartment. She now is getting a puppy and puppies are expensive. You know, she's going to have a dependent now. So I think it's important to make sure that what your child is going to do with that education correlates, especially if you have debt, correlates to an income level or a potential income level that's going to put them in a good place. So that's the other thing. I think it's tragic when, first of all, it's horrible. Some jobs just pay terribly. But, you know, just to stereotype it, you know, whether it's teacher, social worker, journalist is a job that doesn't pay very well. Um, in many cases, as people who read the book know, business news pays a little bit better. But if you're going to go into college and you think you're going to do one of those jobs when you graduate, really think carefully about how much you're spending for college because it's going to be very hard to pay back those loans. So, you know, maybe you want to go and spend two or three years in a super high income job, the highest income you can get, even if you sort of hate it, I hate to say that, to just knock down that income, that loan, and then you can live your life. Because I don't want people in their 40s paying back their student loans, and I really don't want parents in their 60s paying off their children's student loans. So really try to find other sources of income. And by the way, I want to recommend Ron Lieber's other book. I believe the exact title is The Price You Pay for College is a great resource for parents looking at colleges because the prices vary a lot and you have some control, more control than you might think over the price that you pay for your child's college education. And Ron does a great job of explaining the different tuitions that are sometimes presented to candidates. Believe it or not, there is a retail price, which some people like us paid. But if you have something the school wants, sometimes you can get um, a different price, even if it's not necessarily a traditional scholarship that you would think of. There's all kinds of merit awards when you're accepted, and you can sometimes negotiate depending on um, how much money you have and how much money your family has. With your daughter making the choice to not go down the path of teaching and to go into cybersecurity and computers. What influence did you have as a parent and how much of that came from her? A lot came from her based on her goals. She wanted to be financially comfortable. She wanted to be able to go out with her friends and not worry about money. She really wanted to own her own apartment, which is something, as you know, I go into um, a lot in the book because it was a huge milestone for her. And she is you have a so, question proud, about that. so proud of it. Um, Has she really been saving for her first apartment since age 13? Yes. Yes. Now, when I say that, you know, she had babysitting jobs. She was always enterprising. She also, she was really smart. She, she worked as a lifeguard, but she went, and because I don't have a lifeguard, lifeguard background, I can't tell you the specifics, but when you're a lifeguard, there's different levels of training that you can get. And so she went and got, you know, worked her way up through, you know, different tests and courses. So you're the highest level of training. 
that you can be for a lifeguard so you can get the most pay. So she was ambitious even then that if she's going to be a lifeguard, she's going to be the highest paid lifeguard. And then she was always enterprising. She would say, well, maybe I can give swimming lessons to the kids, right, that are at the camp if they want extra help with swimming. So then she could get babysitting clients and so on. So she was. She always had jobs and was always saving up for this. I think, and, and it's since age 13, because that's really when she and her brother came to live with us full time. Um, from having been sort of joint and then, you know, originally they were with their mother. Um, and I, she knew that I had bought an apartment when I was 23 and how much, because we, we now have a three bedroom condo in New York city. How did that happen on a journalist salary? Well, number one, full disclosure, my husband's not a journalist, but also it started, we had real estate that we were, you know, that I was flipping through the years. So I flipped from a studio to one bedroom and so on. And that studio came about because, you know, I bought an apartment at, at 23. So she really, you know, thought that was a good idea rather than living with tons of roommates in rentals and never kind of having that stability. She wanted a home and she wanted to own it very much so. Her brother, by the way, has not shown any interest. So it has to be something your kid actually wants. You can't really make them do that kind of stuff. You have to figure out what they want to do and then help them get there. Yeah. It's, it's proof that each kid is very different. Each situation is different. And as a parent, you're, you have to take that into consideration. It sounds like with your daughter, she was kind of built that way, personality wise. She was saving yes. money. She was eager to make more. She knew what she wanted her lifestyle to be. Um, but I was curious, did you need to foster some of those conversations or not? In her case, it sounds like you didn't. I mean, need to, but maybe you did just naturally as part of your. Yeah. I, I think, you know, in general, what I advocate in the book and advocate in just in life, I mean, and it's sort of obvious, but I think money should be, they, people say, oh, how do I teach my kid about money? Should I have a meeting about it? No, it's just as you go through life. I remember my son, it gets, I mean, it's kind of probably really annoying to have me as your mom because I do this and they get a little, I get a little eye roll sometimes, but I remember in December, um, I think my, I want to say he was about 10 and we had an appointment at a doctor. I think he hurt his toe. They thought it was broken, something like that. And it wasn't his normal pediatrician visit. And I told him, I said, I'm really happy this happened in December because we've, you know, used up our deductible. And so we'll only have to pay the copay. Do you want me to explain that to you? And he was like, mom. I know by now. And he sort of explained it to me. He's like, you know, it was just funny. He was like annoyed because they, I, I narrate the li our life a little bit to them and maybe over explain. So maybe there's a happy medium. <laughs> then, you know, you shouldn't necessarily be like me with your kids because it's probably too much, but they do, they do hear you, even though you don't think they hear you, they do. But that's how proud a moment as a parent to get that response back. Yeah. I also think I drive them crazy. So, you know, <laughs> there's that. Uh my thinking is that it's well-intentioned, <laughs> so I would chalk it up as a victory. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. But look, it, it's, I, I hope I'm helping them. I hope they're, you know, I, I know they're, they get a kick out of the book. Um, I know Ashley's really happy about the epilogue and all the accolades that she's gotten from it, and she's really proud of that. And they know that we're proud of them. But it's, look, it's hard. Even now, I mean, I, I talked about the, you know, the older one, the older son is graduating from, from um, college and he's been studying film and TV. And for his final project, I was annoyed at this. I think that NYU should, you know, give them the funding they need for these projects or they shouldn't need funding, but he needed to raise a certain amount of money. And he came to us and said, or he needed an amount of money to do the film. And he came to us and said, well, I need this amount of money for the film. What do I do? And we kind of said, well, what are you going to do? Because I was like, we're not writing a check for this. Like there's no way. Cause I, you know, I just, we weren't going to do it. And I think an important part of the movie business is raising money. So he is on Indiegogo. If anyone wants to fund Meatball Town, the movie, feel free to contribute to Bradley's fundraiser. Um, but he's been doing a great job. I mean, yesterday he told me that he reached out to a woman he used to work for and she gave a very substantial contribution four times what his father and I gave, by the way, like a very substantial contribution to his campaign. And the positive energy from that was incredible because this woman is not like, it's not like his relative. It's not one of our friends that we asked to contribute. This is someone that only knows him. I don't know this person. I don't even know her name. 
and she believed him him enough to give him a substantial amount of money for his film. What a, I mean, how amazing is that for a kid, right? To have that validation from an adult that is not, you know, doesn't have to love you. Invaluable learning for yeah. sure. Yeah. It's hard though. Cause we're thinking like, what if he doesn't raise the money for the film? Are we going to step in and, and close the gap? And I'm like, I don't want to do that. And, you know, but we don't want him to not have the money to make the film. And you know, what if the film is not made the way he wants? Cause he doesn't have the right funding and we have to just like control ourselves and believe in him. And it's really hard to step back and just say, nope, we have confidence in him. He's going to do it. How will you and your husband celebrate when Bradley graduates from NYU and you no longer have that tuition bill? So the tuition bill is happening tomorrow. Not that I'm counting. <laughs> so I don't know. What should we do? Tell me. Our last tuition bill is tomorrow. <laughs> we still have his rent though, because he, he has his apartment until August. So we have to still, we're going to pay his rent through. We told him we pay through the end of the lease. For his, his roommates, they all have a, like, quote, off campus, which off campus is, you know, in, in downtown Manhattan. But uh, we did say we would pay his, his rent until the lease was over. Um, and then it's up to him if he either moves home or figures out a different arrangement. So, but the big chunk ends, yeah, tomorrow. How should well, we congrats. celebrate, Andy? You tell me. Congrats How on we the celebrate? book. Congr I don't know. It's different for everybody. <laughs> I mean, you may just breathe again. <laughs> I mean, we have and three relax. kids. We're like, we're like down to one out of three tuitions. It's like, oh my gosh, this is so exciting. Yeah. You still need to save yeah. since you have one more. Uh, just go to yeah. dinner. That's good enough. <laughs> it's all good though. It's good. You're not ready we're for really... a big trip yet. <laughs> no. Well, no, we're, we are going to do a family trip um, to, we're going to, we haven't traveled in so long because of the pandemic. And here's an interesting thing. We were going to go, we're going to go to Alaska and, um, I wanted to go on one of these sort of um, uh, more expedition trips where it's sort of a rustic boat, but just really, you really learn about nature and the place. And the kids pushed back and they said, we want to go, we're going on just like a big celebrity cruise <laughs> and it's half the price. And I just kind of gave up. I was like, okay, I'm not going to fight with them. They want to go on the big generic boat and there's going to be all the amenities and stuff. It will be a little bit light on the education, but I was like, you know what? At the end of the day, this is a trip that I want to be a fun family trip. And I, if I force them to do what I think we should do versus what they want to do, they're not going to have as much fun. So you have to kind of let them lead a little bit and lean into their, their priorities sometimes. And their priority is really to make a vacation mode with seeing Alaska versus like a true Alaska expedition. That's just not what they want right now. Um, if it had been double the cost, maybe we wouldn't have done it, but it was half the cost. So I'm like, all right, I'm getting off easy. Well, you have to see, seize those opportunities when your financial grownups want to go on a trip with you and to spend time together on a cruise, since all of that is limited too. Exactly. Well, I think it is really important to balance spending, you know, saving for retirement, doing all of those things, but also recognizing my husband and I are both in our 50s. I'm 52. My husband's 55. We are, to my knowledge, completely healthy, mobile, all the good things. All of our kids are healthy. We don't know what the future will hold. So it is really important to go on this vacation and to do other things that we can do now because we don't know what the future will hold. My mom, her birthday is next week. She passed away at age 62. So in my mind, you know, that's only 10 years from now. And thank God she did so much. She was a big traveler. She went to Antarctica. She went everywhere. Um, we went on family trips. We were weird. We went on family trips to Russia and Cuba and to Machu Picchu and to um, Easter Island and, you know, all these crazy places that are not necessarily the typical places that families go. But I think she just had an adventurous spirit and always wanted to see the world. And I don't know. I wish I got to travel with you as a kid. I know, right? <laughs> it's so weird. It's weird that we went to Russia. When it opened up in the 90s, um, we went. Yeah. So weird looking back, right? I love that Ashley wrote the epilogue. I feel like that was the that was the bow to your entire book. Having yes. her having her put having her ha have her input in there um representing her perspective was fantastic. Yeah, and she has really good money tips. Doesn't she? Yep. And it was great. she and she justifies, I was very upset while she's home saving for this apartment during the pandemic, she and her boyfriend bought 
and we live in New York City, she and her boyfriend bought season passes for Disney World in Orlando during the pandemic. I was not happy. I was like, this is ridiculous. You're undermining your, you, you said you had this goal. How are you buying, you know, $1,200 tickets and you're trying to save money to buy an apartment in New York City? How could you possibly do that? So if you read the app blog, you'll hear what Ashley has to say. And she justifies it. I did it. read that and I haven't done the math. <laughs> it made me wonder. I'm like, should I buy that? No, I do not need that. I'm not even no, going to no. look into the details. No, I still have reservations, but you know, that's, that it illustrates it very well. At the end of the day, if your children are living within their means, know what they're doing and make proactive grown up decisions, it is their life and you have to let them live their life. Just like my dad, he's very proud of me as a journalist now. It's not what he would have chosen. I certainly could not be a cybersecurity consultant. I am clueless about that stuff, but that's what she chose to do. And she's really happy doing it in that it, gives her the means to live the lifestyle that is important to her. So let them live their own life, but be there to cheer them on. I love it. Bobby, I, I usually ask all the Inspired Money guests, how do you define success today in terms of being a parent to young financial grownups? How do you define success? Watching them grow into their own financial grownups and cheering them on simple as that, just being there and watching them grow and letting them go in a way that allows you to bond um, and really be together as a family, even as they're adults, but accept them as who they are, not who you had an imaginary vision of them being. Let them be themselves and love them as themselves. Yeah. And I think for me, allowing them to make some of those financial mistakes, because I, th I think that I'm much more willing to let my kid fall down because I, I, I guess my fear of falling is less than how much I dislike losing money. <laughs> so, <laughs> so for me, like I have to let them make the financial mistakes too. You, you can limit it, but you do have yeah. to let them. Yeah. You have to let them make those mistakes sometimes. And sometimes what you think is going to be a mistake is not. That's the other thing to remember. I mean, I share the story of Jen Barrett, who, by the way, is also the author of um, Think Like a Breadwinner. And she talks about her son and he was buying um, things online, like in the, in the uh, what do you call it? Like the metaverse, I guess you call it, like, you know, just stuff. And he was flipping it and selling it and making money. And she was sort of, First, she's mortified that he's, you know, you're paying real world money to buy fake world stuff. And then she understood that he understood the market and he was actually making a profit doing this. So he knew what was going on in that market. He was successful in that market and she had to sort of just learn to understand it. That doesn't mean it's not going to all implode one day. I have no idea. But the kid was doing much the same thing as a trader might do with stocks. Right. So you have yeah. to kind of adjust your mindset and don't assume that them doing something that you are not comfortable with, that they're comfortable with is a mistake. It just may not be something that's right for you, but it could be right for them. We do look, most of our jobs didn't exist when our parents were growing up and deciding what they were going to be when they grow up. And a lot of the jobs our children will have did not exist when we were in that position. So it's important to accept that their goals, their dreams, and their opportunities may be very different from what we experienced. We have to admit that we don't know everything. Oh my gosh, please. <laughs> <laughs> the older we get, the less we know. <laughs> Absolutely true. I'll be taking the bus when I'm 82. <laughs> <laughs> Tell the Inspired Money viewers and listeners where they can follow you, get your book, and become a financial grown-up. So everything is centered on my website, bobbyrebell.com. There you can also see where if you want me to come speak to your company or to your group, just go to the work work with Bobby tab and you can get information on that. I just opened a TikTok account. So if you're on TikTok and want to watch something super cringy, it's just under my name, just under Bobby Rebell. Uh, most of my uh what do you call it? Usernames. Um, what do you call it, Andy? My uh Handle? My handles are just at Bobby Rebel, the exception being Instagram, where it's Bobby Rebel and then the number one. So, and please, if you buy the book, please leave a review on Amazon. It really helps the algorithm. And if you show me that and DM me, I will thank you online. Awesome. Thanks, Bobby. Thank you. So, what was your favorite inspired money moment? Bobby shared lots of useful tips today. For me, 
I realized that it's important to let kids make their own financial mistakes, just like it is for them to physically fall down sometimes. That's a hard lesson for parents because it's easier said than done. What do you think? If you had a different favorite Inspired Money moment, post a comment here or in the Inspired Money Makers Facebook group at inspiredmoney.fm slash Facebook. Thanks for watching to the end. I want to invite you to subscribe to my email that goes out every two weeks. The Runnymead Investment Team, that includes yours truly, shares data, news, and events that we're looking at. Subscribe by going to inspiredmoney.fm slash newsletter. Thank you for joining me on this mission. Have an inspired week and do something that scares you because that's where the magic happens.